Hi guys, my name is Nick Broughton and I'm a random fish. Hit the subscribe button and let's all be random fishes together, shall we? Oh my god. This fucking movie. Okay. So, a while ago, last week, I made a request to you guys if you had any ideas or something worth watching that I should watch it. To put it forward and that I would attempt to watch it. Now, no one came forward with anything except one person who um, is in the midst of uh, discussing with me something that, that I'm going to uh, review at some point in the future. So I had to keep myself busy. I was going through a lot of stuff over the week, figuring out what it is that I wanted to watch, what it was that I thought I should watch, and everything else on top of it. The problem I now have is that, unfortunately, for me anyway, I don't really like to watch things more than once or twice all the way through unless I really, really enjoy them. Or I really, really despise them. Like, I really enjoy picking a film apart. This is one of the reasons why I think I used to own Spider-Man 3 on DVD, because I used to mock it so much. But, thanks to the glory of Netflix, I do have the ability to watch things more than once. I rewatched Inoda, I rewatched Inoda Holmes a couple of times, and obviously for me, the opinion does not change. But then I came across something that I really found myself going, what the fuck at? And that film is Vampire Academy. If you haven't come across Vampire Academy, all I'm saying is that you have the mercy of the Lord. You really do. Vampire Academy is essentially the vampiric version of Jupiter Ascending. A bunch of really random words, a bunch of intense philosophy, backstory, all this sort of stuff, and no real storytelling. Um, for example, the opening scene says ev does tries to set everything up to a whole bunch of exposition that is so brutally, haphazardly forced, and then you have the main, the main character, if you will, describing all of these things and talking about, the, the, for example, Okay, I hate the fact that I remember these names. You have these things called the Moroi and the Stigori, I think it is. I, I'll be honest, it's leaving my memory now, which is wonderful. Um, and there's this other side, the Dampier, I think it is. Literally, calling yourself the Dampier, so close to vampire, yet you put a DH at the beginning of it, and you lose the E at the end. That is it. That is all it is. Good Lord. Um... Everything that bugs me about Vampire Academy is it possibly due to the fact that it was n probably not a very popular studio-made film. It was possibly one of those whole, um, you know, the, those the, those attempted those mockbusters, if you will, of certain things, you know. But the sad thing is that the film very much likes to do this thing where, for example, when they try to describe the Maroi, the main character does anyway. They talk about how the Maroi can walk in sunlight, but do, but gets doesn't burn up, but gets sort of severely stung by being outside. They apparently don't burst into flames, and they and she, and, she, and she says this in the film, and they don't sparkle either. So you're trying to tell me that this isn't Twilight, but it's still not proper vampire. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but. What is this obsession we have of trying to change the vampire mythos to fit our own bizarre sensibilities? I mean, I'll be honest, do I ultimately enjoy vampires the way they are? They can stand to be improved upon, certain aspects of the mythos can be improved upon, of course I represent that. But at the same time, the very basics of a vampire, in any story, yes, this is a thing, I am doing this tangent, a vampire's main weaknesses are sunlight, a state of the heart, and everything else is slightly negotiable. The whole church thing, the holy thing, that can sort of be kind of used, but it's not as big. Um, the, the, the running water thing, again, kind of the same thing. It very much... It very much likes to live in this world, we very much like to live in this world where we try and change the vampire mythos to suit us, because we want vampires to appear more vulnerable and more human to us. But the whole point of a vampire is that these are people that we want to be, like the the best versions of us. They're not vulnerable little emo kids sat in a corner 
going, oh, my life is so tormented, and oh, my God. The vampires I grew up with, at least the vampires that I remember growing up with anyway, were charming, charismatic, weird dudes who stood, you know, in the shadows, in black suits or in trench coats or whatever, and they would walk up and they would almost glide up to a young woman and they would say, you know, they would be very charming, they would be very lovely, and they would be very nice, and everything else, they would lead them all away, and then the fangs would come out and then the feeding would begin, or the turning would begin. Now, this might be because of a combination of things. I might, I, I, when it came to the first vampire films I think I ever saw, I think I saw Blade at what, 2 at one point, and I think when I was younger I also saw Interview with a Vampire and Queen of the Damned. Are these the best vampire films to start off with? Well, I saw Lost Boys about six years later, so probably not, but still could be a lot worse. But Interview with a Vampire really did, and Queen of the Damned actually in a lot of ways, really did cement to me what a vampire's main mythos was. You could, you could expand everything else outside of that, but you have to keep things in the exact same place for vampires. I'm sorry, you do. The whole point of being a vampire is that you have to elevate that person above being human. And rant over. But back to the film. This shitty, forgettable film. In this film you have vampires, although they don't like to use that word. You have evil vampires, though they prefer if you use that word. And then you have the human guardians. Then there's the beautiful thing about a special bond, where a human and a vampire can, you know, the human can see things through the vampire's eyes when their eyes glow gold or some such. Which is kind of interesting. It's kind of a unique twist. Okay, I like that. I like this idea. Very good, very good. So, of course, the, the human, who is the one who's sharing the special bond, is, of course, a novice at protecting vampires. So she learns from, oh, look at that, the slightly athletically built, with a slight accent dude who is incredibly good at fighting, and, yeah, that's the guy that she'll crush on for the rest of the film. Okay, gotcha. And then, of course, the vampire that she's friends with also comes across another vampire who, you know, again, is charming and, you know, and is the, the emo boy in the corner being like, you know, you think you're the only one who knows loss and, oh, my God, my life is so tormented. I have nothing against vampires who have a tormented life. Nothing against it at all. But when your film is mostly filled with people saying being a vampire is so terrible, get over yourself! You're freaking immortal! You know what I mean? But anyway, the thing that actually got me about this was the, the, the kid that the, the vampire main character is crushing on uh, is also played by the same actor who would end up playing, um, uh, I think it's Chase in Shadowhunters. So you know what? Not the worst thing. He's kind of cool. He's a good actor. I like him. He's fine. And then, of course, we get the grown-ups in the film. One of them is a vampire who's dying of something. Uh, the other one is a strict headmistress who runs the place uh, and all of that sort of thing. So which one of these do you honestly think is going to be the villain? You'd think the headmistress from the get-go, okay, okay, that's fine. How about if I tell you that the vampire main character has the ability to heal? Something that isn't been, hasn't been seen before in vampires, from, apart from, you know, the guy that founded the school that they're staying in. There you go! The old vampire dying of something, yes, of course. Did we predict this from the beginning? Mm, kind of. I mean, when it was kind of predicted that she could heal, I was a bit like... There's a dude who's dying of something, and they haven't told anyone that she has the power to heal. Yeah, he's going to be the bad guy. There's also a nerdy friend who comes in and joins the lot, who turns out to be evil. Now, she, I kind of didn't see coming. I didn't see her going quite that direction. I thought she was going to be more badass, um, like in the final battle or something, but I thought she'd be on the side of, you know, on the good guy's side, instead of on the bad guy's side, but she still came off as badass, so it's pretty cool. Although she was still a bit whiny. Um, and then this, of course, leads into the very popular thing that I will always say that I know will piss people off constantly and consistently. 
vampires and teen romances, you can work, but you have to work in a very specific way. Lost Boys got this. You had a main set of characters who were human. One of them becomes a half vampire, won't become a full vampire until he drains, until he drinks blood properly from another person. That's fine. The vampires are still the bad guys because the half vampire doesn't want to feed and wants to go back to being human and wants to save what the, the female vampire along with her kid, I think it is, and everything else. Okay? It's pretty good. In this film, we have a vampire and a human working together. Both of them are lamenting about how bad their lives are in some way, shape or form, or rather the vampire is more lamenting than the human is, if I'm going to be absolutely honest. The, the, the vampire does this whole thing about trying to become... For some reason, this turns less into a vampire film and more like into the vampire version of Mean Girls, with a vampire with the ability to, to temporarily confuse people and to make them think things that they want to think. For some reason, vampires have multiple powers as well, which, again, I have nothing worried about, but if you're actually talking about vampires who have specific abilities at specific points... What is this? What?! But anyway, so it's, it's the vampire version of Mean Girls for a little bit, and then it jumps into, oh no, there's an actual threat here, oh my god, people are actually doing things that are horrible, oh, oh my god, bad guy is beaten, bad guy gets put in jail, oh look, something comes out that's unexpected, causes the bad guy to try and run away again, the bad guy then gets taken out again, uh, everybody kisses, it's all lovely, it's all lovely jubbly, all very hot and heavy, move on, the end. Okay. Okay. But this film wasn't a good vampire film. If it had been, say, a film about a witch and her best friend living in a school full of witches, you know, human sort of helpers with witches, that'd be kind of cool. I kind of like that idea. Someone who has a specific bond with a specific person, that's, that's kind of interesting, I like that idea. But why did it have to be vampires? Why couldn't it have been witches or something like that? Because I'll be honest, one of the big things with vampires is that the vampires are normally the bad guys. And we seem to have entered into this era where vampires are the love interests, the tormented soul type, the, you know, all of that. And I've already complained about that. But this is why I think it's bad for storytelling. The whole point of being a vampire is that you are elevated, is that you are better. And vampires are, by their very nature, at least from what I've read over the course of the years, they are very much either completely obsessed with being better than humans or those that want to exist and not disturb humanity. Bear in mind, I said this very carefully. Don't be seen by humanity. You want to live alongside, but, you know, in the shadows, alongside humanity. This is where I have my problem. Vampires and humans, most logically speaking, if it's a specific chosen few, that's cool. And that's why this film isn't so isn't that aggravating to me, because it appears it's one of those sort of, you're chosen for that kind of thing mentality, which is fine. But, when you proceed to sit there and you talk about vampires working with mortals, you open a lot of floodgates. And the whole point of having, like humans and vampires do not mix well. We've seen this in a lot of that and a lot of the Underworld movies, if I'm going to be absolutely honest. Specifically speaking, we noticed this in uh, Underworld 4. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. It's not Blood Wars, but it's the one before that. I think it's Awakening, maybe? Possibly? Yeah, Underworld Awakening, I think. But the idea was, was that once vampires and werewolves were discovered by humanity, humanity tracked them, supposedly tracked them all down. But that's a conversation for another time. But the problem is, is that when you have this type of movie where you have these humans and vampires working alongside each other and vampires can walk out in the sun 
there's a scene where they're in a, to use the American expression, a mall. Oh my god. They're in a mall. And there's somebody who comes along and asking if they want to, you know, he says, you look very tense, would you like a massage? And she grabs him and nearly pops his, his shoulder out of its socket, holds him down, and he's going, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And I'm sorry, is it just me, or would that not have raised some suspicions at some point in time? Like, if this whole thing's meant to be a secret society, why the fuck is this happening? Seriously. Why the fuck would you even allow people to be outside in the real world if that's the kind of shit that goes down? You know what I mean? Um, the whole point about being, of, of being, of being vampiric is that you have to remain in the shadows of these things. You can't be around humanity almost at all unless the plot at the time creates a scenario in which you are able to be around humans and you're able to control your better impulses around humans. Having sideways glances, having a think about it, like licking your lips whenever you see someone accidentally cutting themselves, you see the blood. That's cool. That creates tension. That did not create tension. That created a giant red flag that someone should have seen and started reporting to the authorities. That's what that did. And lastly, before I sign off about this movie, one thing I want to just quickly try and bring up. Visual effects. You're probably going to expect me to tell you that they're shit, aren't you? They weren't bad, actually. Were they fantastic? No. But I'll be honest, I've reached a point in my life where I just don't care. I mean, I've seen enough of the Marvel movies to know that their effects aren't always the best. So, I mean, whenever I see a film with silly CGI effects, it could be a hell of a lot worse. I mean, they could have been like that entirely CGI film from years and years and years ago. It, it could have been like, it could have been, you know, like um, Roland Emmerich's film, 3000 BC. That could have been... that. That's atrociously bad. Um, you know, it could have been a lot worse. You could have made the whole thing on a soundstage and not even attempted to have anything even slightly on a set. Um, which is clearly what they have done. They've clearly done something. So that's not too bad, I guess. It could have been a lot worse. Is it a good film? Hell no. But it's not an atrocious film, wreck. Despite what I thought when I was going into it. I know that's kind of all over the place, but to be honest, that kind of feels like the film in general. It feels like you have some things good to say about it, but then there's other stuff where you sit there and just think to yourself, my God, why the hell would they allow this to even leave the cutting room floor? Or leave the camera, for that matter. Good Lord. But, hey, that's just me. That's just another day in the Random Fish life. But you know what? I'll see you later, my little Random Fishes. Random Fish out.